Rudy, thanks, David. Thank you all for watching. So I grew up during apartheid in the 50s and 60s in South Africa. And apartheid was a really cruel regime. It was um, embedded in the law that everyone was segregated. Apartheid means separate. So there were separate er areas where blacks lived and where whites lived. And they even had a classification for mulattoes, for coloreds. And everyone had to live in separate areas. Everyone had to go to separate schools. Everyone had to do everything separately, including go to separate hospitals. And I always chose to work in black hospitals. And this is me in 1980, 40 years ago, I was an intern. I just finished medical school. And in South Africa, you have to work for a year in a hospital during, to, the, to begin your residency. And this is me um, in the internal medicine department during my internship. And interestingly enough, at Baraguanath Hospital, this was my first exposure to non-traditional medicine. I was trained in South African medical schools, which are top medical schools. In fact, most people from all over the world wanted South African doctors, um, but we got trained in traditional medicine. And my first exposure to non-traditional medicine or sangomas, traditional healers, was when I worked on, in the hospital. And uh, what I noticed, and I didn't take it too seriously, was when patients... Uh, would call in a sangoma when we couldn't help them. And sometimes I noticed that the sangoma actually helped some of these patients. But as I said, it didn't really mean anything to me because I'd been brainwashed by traditional medicine. After my year at the hospital, I went to work in what they called homelands. It's sort of like an Indian reservation in South Africa. The government tried to divide all the black tribes and put them into their specific areas. So this is an area called Kwandebele, where they paint their houses and they wear these beautiful beads. And it was an inc incredibly humbling experience because I went there as an arrogant doctor and I learned so much. I learned about Ubuntu. Ubuntu means what makes us human is a humanity we show each other. And there was true Ubuntu there. Wherever I went, I was always invited in for a meal and they would get upset if I wouldn't join them, even if they had very little food for themselves. I also learned about community, which is so important in these cultures, which wasn't as important in white South African culture. And I realized how important community is to healing. I had much more exposure to traditional healers, to Sangomas, and I realized the power of the Sangomas. On the left is a Sangoma, uh, and on the right is a woman, it was the wife of a Sangoma, actually crushing herbs. And once again, I noticed when we couldn't help the patients and the patients would go to the Sangoma, I saw that the Sangoma was helping patients. And I realized how important belief and context in the culture is. As the Dalai Lama actually says, the three most important aspects in Tibetan medicine are the belief of the practitioner, the belief of the patient, and the karma between the two. And that was very true for the African medicine there. It's actually even true for what, the way we practice. How often does someone go to a doctor with a viral infection, they get given an antibiotic, and just because they believe in the doctor, they get better, in spite of the fact that the antibiotic doesn't really work for a virus. And here is the end of a traditional ceremony where these young men go up into the mountains to actually train to become men. And at the end of the ceremony, they get circumcised. And there's no sterilization, and who knows what they put on, but in, in my... 18 months in Kwandabele, I only saw one infected penis. So obviously, there is a lot of uh, traditional herbs and, and traditional wisdom, things we don't know about that are actually effective. So that was a very humbling experience. And I came back to Johannesburg for six months. I wrote my exams and I, we came to America. My wife and I did not want to live under apartheid anymore. Um, I we came to America. I got offered a job 
in the South Bronx of New York in 1984. And in those days, the South Bronx was pretty burnt out. Um, so I started my residency at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx. And after a couple of weeks of my training, I was very, very disillusioned. I realized this is not what I want to do. In South Africa, even in the traditional hospitals, we didn't have the money to pay for expensive tests. We'd have to take a really good history, examine a patient, and it was all about the relationship. You had to make a diagnosis and, and treat the patient accordingly. In America, it was very different. Even although the, the patients were sort of similar, it was in a very poor socioeconomic um, area, which was similar to where I was working in South Africa, the medicine was very different. In America, it was all about a quick history, quick examination, and more importantly, we had to read up about what was going on and present the case to the professor the next day. There was no interest in relationships and, and, and taking um, that, that karma between you and the patient seriously. So after a couple of weeks, I said to my wife, I don't want to be a doctor here. Uh, and I'd heard about this acupuncture clinic attached to the hospital. So I took, you know, the walk a couple of blocks over in the burnt out South Bronx. I walk into this clinic and I see about 50 addicts sitting quietly with needles in their ears. And I went, holy shit. These are the same type of patients that we were struggling to treat in the wards. In the wards, they were pulling out their IVs, they were swearing at you, they were very difficult patients. And here these heroin and crack addicts were sitting quietly with needles in their ears. So I went to the guy who ran the clinic and I said, and I introduced myself, I said, I'm a doctor doing my residency uh, <clears throat> in internal medicine at the hospital and I'd love to explore acupuncture. And he loved the fact that I was a doctor interested and he took me under, he, <coughs> He just took me in with open arms. Um, and for the next three years, I lived two completely different lives. I had to finish my residency in the internal medicine wards. And all my spare time, I used to go to the acupuncture clinic. And for three years, I was living these lives where I was seeing different patients. At the hospital, I was seeing crisis care patients. And the medicine was dramatic and heroic. And it was wonderful at treating those patients. People were coming in with acute asthmatic attacks, acute heart attacks. They were, uh, had bad pneumonia or sepsis. And Western medicine was fantastic for them. But then when I'd see the same patients in the outpatient afterwards, they would come in and they were tired and they couldn't poop. Um, and they had headaches. And I didn't know what to do because we didn't have any tools. But at the acupuncture clinic, those same patients who were coming in and they were tired and they had headaches and they couldn't poop, we had tools to help them. So the patients were completely different. The acute crisis patients at the hospital and the chronic low-grade problems I was treating at the acupuncture clinic. I was being taught to see the body in two completely different ways. At the hospital, I was taught to be a mechanic. If a part wasn't working, you take out the part or you try to fix it. Whereas at the acupuncture clinic, I was being taught to see the body like a garden and I was the gardener. And if the plant's leaves were going from green to yellow or brown, I didn't just, I didn't just paint the leaves green. I would have to see, was the plant getting enough water? Was, it get, was the soil good? Or were the roots being impinged upon? Completely different way of seeing it. We're taught to see symptoms differently. At the hospital, if someone had a headache or heartburn, you'd give them an aspirin or you'd give them a PPI or Nexium. You'd suppress the symptom. At the acupuncture clinic, I was taught to see a symptom as some pointer to some imbalance in the system. I was taught to see health differently. At the hospital, you were either sick or you were healthy. There was nothing in between. At the acupuncture clinic, there was this huge gray area between health and disease. And your job as a doctor was to actually shift people over to the healthy side. And we are treating patients very differently. At the hospital, anyone who came in with asthma, everyone got treated the same way. 
Whereas at the acupuncture clinic, five patients could come in with asthma and they would get com treated completely differently. So I realized then and there that the future of medicine was going to be different to what I was being trained in. I realized that Western medicine was wonderful at crisis care, but very poor at the common day-to-day -day problems that most people have. It was a disease care system and not a healthcare system. And I realized that the future would be some combination of the two, some combination of Western medicine and Eastern medicine. And I realized if I really wanted to help my patients, I'd have to explore other alternatives. And I went on a journey of discovery. You know, once I finished at the hospital, I, I went and I discovered and explored Chinese medicine more intensely, nutrition, yoga, meditation, different types of herbal medicine, biofeedback. And about two years after I finished my residency, uh, I was introduced to a man called Jeff Bland who actually is a father of functional medicine. And when I first heard Jeff Bland speak, it was this aha experience for me because he was articulating what I was struggling to understand. I was trying to understand how the hell Chinese medicine worked with qi and meridians because it, was, it made no sense from a Western perspective, but I knew it worked. I was seeing it working all the time. And here, this brilliant guy, Jeff Bland, was articulating what I was struggling to understand. He had come up with a system that he called functional medicine, which took the, which took the biochemistry and the physiology of Western medicine and combined it with the concepts of creating balance and improving function of Chinese medicine. And ultimately, he taught you need to look for the root cause of the disease. And if you look at this picture, the root cause is where it starts, and then, if, and then it presents with some imbalances, whether it's inflammation or mitochondrial dysfunction or uh, digestive problems. And then it presents in the organ system where we look at it in Western medicine. So in Western medicine, we, we, you know, we have different specialties. We have a pulmonologist, and we have a gastroenterologist, and we have a cardiologist. And they may all treat the underlying inflammation in their own organ, but the problem is downstream. And the problem needs to be, the inflammation needs to be treated. And ultimately, the root cause needs to be treated. So now I had tools and I had an operating system to go and practice in a way that I wanted. So in 1992, I started my own practice. So that's almost 30 years ago. And I started you know, put my shingle out and people started coming to me because this, these were early days and, you know, acupuncture was helping and I was changing people's diets and that was helping and the word got out. There was no marketing in those days and people started streaming in and um, <clears throat> I practiced and evolved and evolved and evolved over the years and I learned a lot of things over the last 30 odd years of practicing this way. Uh, primarily, I learned that most of the chronic problems that people have on a daily basis actually can be helped, not by the training that I got in Western medicine, but this new model that, that was being created. But most of the ways that we treated these patients were lifestyle changes, how, how they ate, changing their diet, what supplements, targeted supplementation, how they slept, how they dealt with their stress. We needed to change a lot of these ordinary habits that people had to actually affect change. And I also realized that we all are as unique as our fingerprints. Everyone is different. Uh, and you can treat one person one way and it won't work for the next person. And in fact, it will do violence or harm to the third person. So this understanding how unique everyone is was very, very important. And I realized that my model of, of naming a disease and giving a disease a name and then treating the name was just so far off base for what most people were struggling with. And I realized what is more important than naming a disease. And that was asking just two simple questions. 
what does this patient need to remove or what are they putting into or onto their body that is harming them? And the second question is, what do they need to add? What are they lacking? And when I started thinking that way, I started solving a lot more problems. And lastly, what's probably been the most important thing I've learned from practicing this way is from starting out as seeing myself as a doctor who's going to tell someone what to do. I realized that I was really a partner on someone's health journey. And my job was to teach and to guide and to motivate. And that was more important that was more important than imposing my values and my treatment on someone else. So I've written five books, as Rudy said, and this is the last one that I wrote that came out two years ago, which is probably my favorite because I put a lot of this knowledge into this book. Uh, I'd realized that it's the ordinary things that we do on an everyday basis that have extraordinary effects. But how do we actually make those um, habits or how do we make those little things we do habits? And I've, I've found out that that was really the key. If you can create or if, if someone can learn something and redo it and keep doing it and it becomes a habit, then it becomes easy. And, you know, there's a wonderful saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. So the idea of the book, of the book was to take all these tips, uh, over 100 tips, divided into the six keys, which I thought were the pillars of health. How to eat, how to sleep, how to move your body, how to protect yourself from toxins and chemicals, how to unwind and relax, and how to connect how to connect to yourself, to others, and to the environment. And I did something very interesting in this book, which I'd never done on any of my other books. For all these years, I had tried to understand Eastern medicine from a Western perspective. But in this book, I took my Western knowledge and I tried to put it into an Eastern perspective. And I'd been very influenced by mandalas. You know, I'd used, I'd been taught to sometimes use a mandala as, as a meditation. So I took a mandala and I tried to put these six pillars of health into a mandala and create a new map for a new era of medicine. And if you look at this mandala, um, in, a regular mandala will have something in the, in, the, in the center with four gates. And if you look in the middle, there's a circular, uh, in the middle of that circle, is a heart, which is you, which you, and you are the caretaker of your health right at the center, not the doctor. And as we go out from the center, there are these six rings, these, these six keys that ripple outward, starting with the most material, how you eat, and then going to how you sleep and how you move, and to the, <clears throat> the most subtle, which is how to connect. And I kept on going by the philosophy. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And people kept coming in. And actually, the second part of the philosophy is actually even more beautiful. When the student is really ready, the teacher will disappear. So that's how I was practicing for many, many years, just doing my thing, teaching, writing books, seeing patients. And then COVID-19 arrived. And COVID-19 has exposed the flaws in our patriarchal society. We now see the collapse of the medical system, the food system, the economic system, and the political system. And because we just didn't have the time, and just because we were sort of comfortable enough that we didn't want to change things, we just let be. And it always reminded me of how I felt when I was in South Africa. When I was in South Africa during apartheid, you knew that the system was rotten. You knew that everyone was, not everyone, but most of the people were walking around just accepting this as normal. But it wasn't normal. But there they would put you in jail. Uh, here they weren't putting you in jail, but no one was really doing anything serious about changing the system. The medical system continued, although we had a subculture 
of alternatives of medicine and functional medicine. The food system doesn't really work for most people because the poor can only afford the crap that the food industry churns out to them. You know, the, 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 the cheap foods are subsidized by the government, the wheat, the corn, all the crap is subsidized. If we can, we support local farmers. Unfortunately, that's not the current food system. And in fact, what happened with COVID-19, they had to kill, they had to slaughter a lot of animals, yet food banks didn't have enough food. So the food system's rotten. We all know the inequities in the economic system. The, politi the political system has just gotten worse and worse, this us versus them. So we all now realize that we have to change. We have to create a new normal. We cannot go back to the way we all lived. We, there's an urgency now, folks. We cannot just accept all those systems. That patriarchal system is not working for most people. All of us have to work towards a new normal to recognize that we are all connected. You know, Rudy talked about it in, in his introduction, and it's what I learned in, in, in Chinese medicine. We humans are microcosms of the macrocosms of the macrocosm, which is the earth. Not only are we all connected to each other, but we all connected to the earth. And if the earth is sick, we're gonna be sick. And if we treat the earth the way we treat the earth, we can't expect it not to have these cytokine storms of, of wildfires or floods or hurricanes. So we have to realize that we're all connected, not only to other people, but to the earth in general. We have to slow down and literally smell the roses. We have to realize what's important in life. You know, we've all taken so many things for granted. You know, I just, uh, I'm lucky enough to, my daughter just had a, a son, I have a grandson, and it's, so, it's been so beautiful to watch him grow, to have had the time now to spend and, and watch him grow. So to start appreciating the little things and the people that we take for granted in our lives. And we all do that. I used to do that and I thought I was aware. We have to change how we treat ourselves, how we treat our loved ones, how we treat our fellow human beings and how we treat the earth. And this has to be as a community. The community aspect now has become more and more important. And that's why I love this biohacking community that David's created and that Rudy is now part of. And uh, I think community is the way we have to do it. We have to, the, the, the change is not going to come from above. We as citizens have to be citizen scientists. We have to be politically active. We have to transform the food system. We can't support companies that are not doing the right thing. We have to support companies that are doing the right things. They don't put chemicals and crap in their food. Rudy talked about the factory farming system. If we don't want to, to, to have more and more of these viruses and these superbugs attacking us because they're going to, we have to change the way we treat animals. And factory farming is, one of the, is probably one of the most important things we can change. We can't accept inequities in the economic system. We have to transform our disease care system into a true healthcare system. And ultimately, we have to take care of the earth. As one of my favorite people, the Dalai Lama says, we Buddhists believe that the entire world is interdependent. The outbreak of this terrible coronavirus has shown that what happens to one person can soon affect every other being. This pandemic serves as a warning that only by coming together with a coordinated global response will we meet the unprecedented magnitude of the challenges we face. <clears throat> and as he says, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. So, fo so folks, I implore everyone, be kind to yourself. Be kind to all beings. Be kind to the earth. And as another one of my favorite people, Bob Marley says, one love, one heart. Let's get together and feel all right. Doc, that was incredible. Thank you so much for shedding some light on your wisdom over the years. And I just want to tell the audience, it's been such an honor getting to know you. Um, when we first, first met and started talking about the show, 
uh, we started discussing, you know, how do how do we how do we make a change? How do we uh, how do we do something extraordinary in this talk? And it was just simply, Doc, just talk about your life. I mean, the 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 synchronicity of what's going on with our modern crisis and being in the apartheid. You could not have a better parallel. And the, the, the walk that you walk through medicine, all the way through medical school and into acupuncture school and then treating private patients and now on to educating the public. And we had some kind of offline conversations and it sounds like you wanna get into uh, treating kind of globally patients. Do you wanna, you wanna tell the audience on what your kind of career plans are? Sounds like well, you're... Uh, you're enjoying life, you're a grandfather. Um, what, tell us what Frank Lippman, Dr. Frank Lippman's gonna do. What's your next move? Well, the first thing I need to do is learn how to use Zoom properly, right? No, that, uh, was, just, that was part of the show. We were just messing with the audience. Um, Don't give so, up that secret. <laughs> uh, I have, um, well, what this time has done for me personally, I mean, I've always, sort of was heading towards there, but this has made it more urgent to really um, spend more special time with people I love, um, not to work crazily all different, you know, all long hours. You know, I think we all got caught up in trying to achieve, trying to, to do. Um, and yeah. I think this is a good time we need to be. And, um, well said. you know, this is sort of, uh, putting a lot of what I've learned in all these years, it's just sort of making it more real for me because, you know, someone once taught me, uh, you know, we, we used to talk about revolution in South Africa when I was growing up in apartheid. So the, the beauty of growing up in apartheid is you knew it was rotten, so you questioned every system. Um, but in those days, you were angry and it, it was a, I was in a different space. And someone once told me, um, the most important revolution is the inner revolution. You've got to change yourself before you can change the outside world. Yeah. And um, I agree with you more. You know, and this is sort of what I've realized now, all the work that I've put in to myself and trying to find different ways to help my patients have helped me with this inner revolution and made me stronger to now actually help with what we all need now is not only an inner revolution, but an outer revolution. Unbelievable. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you anymore. Give us, um, give us a day in Dr. Frank Lippmann's uh, in life. What, uh, during this great pause, what are you doing? What are your kind of, you wake up in the morning. Uh, what are you doing now that you've learned after being in this for, you know, almost two months versus the first couple of days that you were in it? You'd said you were kind of chasing your tail a little bit. And then also yeah. if you could piggyback that up with, um, what, have, what have you heard from your patients? Uh, as a collective, and how do you feel society is kind of falling into place with the, the new, better normal? Sure. So I'll just give you a day, a typical day in my life now, which I'm really enjoying. I wake up early in the morning. My grandson wakes up early, so five o'clock, which I usually wake up, but I'm up and I meditate. And I used to meditate fairly regularly. Now I meditate almost every day, and it's fantastic. And I um, often will then, you know, play with Benji, my grandson, a little bit, and then um, <clears throat> I'll go and unfortunately look at all the news and see what's going on. I try to keep up with all the COVID news. Then I'll go for a bike ride, um, and then I'm lucky to have a sauna here. I'm obsessed with my sauna, so I often have a bike ride and a sauna. And Dry then sauna, wet sauna, infrared sauna. <laughs> Infrared sauna. I love my sauna. And then I have a very late breakfast. I generally fast for 14 to 16 hours. Great. And then I'm doing quite a bit of telemedicine, which I'm loving. I'm just loving the awesome. fact that I can see people from all over the world. And, um, you know, I work with my health coach on Zoom. She does everything. And uh, just it's with me. So it's actually yeah. a really wonderful way that I can actually spend time with my family. I've been spoiled. Um, see patients write. I've just finished a book that I've, we've just handed in on building immune resilience and aging, and I'm finishing another book on sleep. So I've been writing a lot. I've been doing a lot of what I want to do. But I think your second question, I had to get that in. Yeah, no, great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I, I think your second question is interesting because I think what's happening is there's 
a convergence of a couple of pandemics. There's the virus that everyone is obsessed about and aware about, and we're trying to social distance and, um, uh, <clears throat> and do all the things that we've been told to do, some of us anyway, wear masks. Um, and then there's the pandemic of fear that we all, and anxiety that most of my patients are dealing with, most everyone is dealing with. Um, and we're going to, that's going to be a big mental health problem after this, you know, the post-traumatic oh. stress. But then there's this underlying pandemic that not enough people are talking about. And that is a pandemic of poor metabolic health, a pandemic of, you know, they calling it comorbidities of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, but there's this pandemic of what I would call downstream sugar dysregulation. You know, they, they talk about, mm. you know, um, 86 million Americans are pre-diabetic and nine out of 10 of them don't even know that they're pre-diabetic. So we have this epidemic of chronic poor health. And when that, to, when the virus invades the host, you talked about Louis Pasteur and the host, about strengthening, strengthening the host. When the virus invades a host that's not really healthy, then it can cause problems. So we're in a place where there's an urgency to get society healthy. There should be you know, you know, proper nutritional guidelines. We should really all take this seriously. We can't have so many unhealthy people because this is going to cause you know, so much death in, in our society. And this is what's happened. You know, America has done the worst for a couple of reasons. But one of the, one of the reasons I think is the metabolic health in America is particularly bad. And that goes back to the food system. Doc, I mean, this kind of a broader skill picture, and we had some offline conversations about healthcare being accessible. Uh, let's be frank, Dr. Frank. Um, you know, we, we, our demographic of patient uh, is, we're a little bit more expensive to see, right? So how do we make this more accessible with this metabolic syndrome that we know is plaguing uh, uh, economic levels that don't see us? So typically, I mean, we are seeing some of these patients, but what advice do you have? How do we make clinical changes in the food deserts and the education in uh, lower socioeconomic uh, uh, societies and communities that just don't have the medical docs that, that you have, you know, the, the Medicaid populations that they just, it's the five minute visit and it's the pill for the ill next. And, you know, how, how do we make this more accessible? What's the solution? I think that's a great question. And I wish I had a solution. Good. I think so what let's I've, talk it out. Right. So what I've realized is there's a lot that we can do by educating the public. There's a lot that I think the responsibility is with us as physicians. I think it's with the media. I think um, it's with the food industry. I think a lot of different groups have to come together um, to help change the system because the system that we had is obviously not sustainable and has broken down completely. So we all have to come together and create different solutions. I yeah. do believe with tech um, and, you know, as you had talked about in our private conversations, Rudy, there are ways that we can get this information to, you know, hundreds, thousands of people at once. Yeah. And I think, you know, this type of forum is a yeah. way we can do it. And a lot of the lifestyle changes that I talk about actually are free. I mean, if we can teach people to meditate, right. which we can, we can right. teach people to, to do some yoga or exercise. The ways of getting a healthier food, cheaper, healthier food to, to, to uh, bigger populations. You know, there's a saying that I always, um, it's a quote of mine, <laughs> which I love. Um, it's the ordinary things that we do on a daily basis that have extraordinary effects on our health. You know, why I play Bob Marley, for instance, Bob Marley music, reggae music beats at about 60 beats per minute, which is about the rate of a slow heart rate. Yep. And if you put on reggae, your body, you entrain at that slower rhythm. So it slows you down. So Bob yep. Marley 
in reggae can be used as a meditation. So we can become creative. It's a way, how do you tune in to the next generation? My generation, I'm 65, my generation, my peers, we fucked up. We screwed up. The, no, serious. We screwed you guys up. Now, I think your generation are much hipper to, to create these changes. I, do, I don't know what the exact answer is, but I do believe there are ways to penetrate the culture in a healthier way. Yeah. But we have, to, you know, this is a political, um, there needs to be a political and economic uh, aspect to this. This has yeah. to also, <clears throat> we have to change the way um, politics works. We can't just subsidize the rich farmers who are growing tons and tons of wheat and corn and making corn right. syrup. We have to support you know, farmers who are doing, as you talked about, regenerative agri agriculture. There are ways we can do this. I mean, there are a lot of wise people around. We've got to listen to them. This shouldn't, it shouldn't be about um, uh, corporations taking over and doing what's, what's right to make money. It's about we should be doing what's right for people in general, for, the, for society. It shouldn't be about just the money. And hopefully this is a time where people are going to get that. And it's your generation, Rudy, David, and, and probably all of you guys who are listening, most of you, who have to, you know, get yeah. off your butts and, and we've got to all do this together. But the only way we're going to do it is as a community. You know, yeah. the community is power. Yeah. Well, you spoke about uh, you, a couple words that hit my mind. Uh, media, consumerism, um, and music. Music is medicine. Absolutely. And we should use music as medicine and arts and culture. Uh, on the drive over here prior to the show, uh, David Choi and I were having a conversation about the kind of tyranny that's happening around the world and, you know, uh, kind of a USA conversation. But, um, you know, we're getting kind of a lot of backlash right now. But how do we make a change in the United States? We got to continue with our arts and culture and lead with music and arts and culture to the promised land, you know, and it's if cool. if we just uh, if we keep starting wars and if we keep pushing with violence, we need peace right now more than ever. And we need unity now more than ever. And we need to teach the younger generations how to act and how to behave and unite the whole globe. This is a global pandemic. We have to all unite from north to south and east to west. And if we don't, it's just not going to work. And that's the great, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of this great pause. We're going to have a great change. There's no better time to flip the script on what's going on. And with leaders like you and the knowledge that you have in passing that knowledge along to your grandchild, that's how we're going to make permanent change. Well, I don't know if I'm a leader in this, but anyway, you are. Um, Doc, you I, are. You are. I, I, I do feel that the old way, which I, I, let's just label it the patriarchal system because it's a very male dominated, um, you know, we use, uh, let's, yeah. even in medicine, you know, we're going to kill this and, and the war on cancer. I just don't think that that hard yang male way is really working. And actually, interesting, I mean, this may be, um, I, I don't know if it's true, but if you look at all, a lot of the women leaders around the world are the ones that are doing the best. I mean, I, I use the New Zealand um, prime minister as an example. I think a, a more feminine, it doesn't have to be a woman, a more feminine way of looking to solve problems, a more yeah. yin way of living. It's not just push, 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 but it's about listening and, and um, and, and receiving more is actually, we, we got to bring more yin into the yang. You know, in Chinese medicine, it's all about the balance. We've been too yang, we've been too aggressive, we've been too masculine. I think we got to change that. There has to be more, we, we want more women or, or more feminine energy. It doesn't necessarily have to be a woman. Some women are, are, are maybe too masculine, but we need more of that feminine energy. Absolutely. I'm not going to make a comment on that because I think my wife, Linda, is listening. I'm getting uh, uh, shouted at by our virtual audience. I think we could probably sit and talk personally all night long, but we got to remember we got some questions out there, Doc. Uh, we had a pre-question yeah. by Amit Dotwani. Can pull it up? 
Good question, Amit. Doc, Amit's question is, my question for Doc has to do with the future or, of organic food. Do you think that organic food will ever be priced to be more accessible to the majority of the human population? If you answer yes, what are some of the steps that need to be taken to achieve that goal? Good question, Amit. Thank you very well, much. Great question, Amit. You know, let's just look at what we call organic. Organic food is basically what was normal food before we started growing <laughs> with pesticides and all the crap that we put on. So organic food is just normal food. Um, so I do think we're going to have to get back to eating food without um, chemicals and we're going to have to get back to organic foods and try and support local farmers. I, I'm not sure, Amit, how this is going to happen. But all I can say is, um, I, I, I do want to bring this up because I do think it's important. Glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, is um, not only used for GMO um, <clears throat> organisms and GMO foods, but Roundup is sprayed on almost all grains and beans in America to dry the crops because the crops can then go and get sold more quickly. So it's just expedient for the farmers. So they spray glyphosate onto the crops. Glyphosate is a registered antibiotic. It's a carcinogen. We are permeating our food system with, these unhealthy, um, with a, this unhealthy pesticide, which is causing all sorts of problems in the microbiome, amongst other things. You mentioned the microbiome. So there's going to have to be a realization that the way we treat our food, which we then eat, is going to affect the strength of the host. It's going, to affect, it's going to affect our immune resilience. More people are going to get sick, so there has to be a change. I mean, I wish I knew how we're going to change it. I do believe there is going to be a change more towards organic food. It is going to become cheaper. As soon as there's more of a market for it, obviously it becomes cheaper. I yeah. think... The younger generation, I know so many of these young kids, kids of, of, of um, my friends who are getting more and more interested in, in re regenerative farming and organic farming. Um, so hopefully things will change. I, um, they have to. We don't have a choice. Yeah. And it starts with conversations like this and it has to spread. And thank God we have virtual platforms that we can create this, this accessibility, right? True story, my father or my grandfather was a farmer um, that thought he was doing the right thing, vegetable farmer, and sat on his fields, sprayed his crops, and died of esophageal cancer. Okay. So the stories hit home. Yep. Doc, yep. thank you so much. Uh, could not appreciate it more. I look forward to having many more conversations with you. Uh, we are going to announce our quiz winner. David Choi, step on stage. All right, everyone. Thank you. I hope everyone's having a great time so far and we're nearing the end. So Jordan, do we have a winner for our trivia question? Oh, actually, let me ask this question to um, Dr. Lipman. So Dr. Lipman, uh, the question was, a recent study done out of the University of Virginia shows that this exercise-induced antioxidant can help with a respiratory problem known as ARDS. Was it A, extracellular superoxide dismutase, B, glutathione, C, uric acid, or D, ubiquinol? Well, I knew it was A because I knew it wasn't B, <laughs> C, or D. <laughs> okay. <Rough. laughs> Great. All right. So... Yes, the answer is A. I'm going to read uh, the explanation here. Research shows that an antioxidant enzyme known as extracellular superoxide dismutase produced while exercising may stave off or lessen the risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome, a condition that occurs when the lungs become so inflamed that they get stiff and swollen, leading to a fluid buildup and oxygen deprivation. ARDS is one of the complications that people with COVID-19 can develop and is associated with a higher death rate from disease. Okay, so now that you know the answer, Jordan, do we have a winner? We sure do. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you to everyone for submitting your answers. So the winner of the Wi-Fi enabled smart scale, and see, can I get a drum roll here? Drum roll. It is Benjamin Alexander. We have All lots right. of 
Congratulations, Ben. You just won a Wi-Fi enabled smart scale and it has the smartphone app, so it's kind of cool. Um, all right, so that's that and uh, gonna bring Rudy back onto the stage. That could not have been more suiting than Benjamin Alexander, dear friend of mine, uh, one that he is actually going to be the first downhill skier for Team Jamaica and the next, the next Winter Olympics, if we ever have them. So Benji, congratulations. Looking forward to working with you during your training. All right. So Dr. Frank Lippman, he doesn't like bragging about himself. So I got to jump up here and brag about him myself. Uh, Doc is, he's got, as we said, 40 years of experience in helping patients build immune resilience and optimizing their health and their health. It's exciting that he's able to truly work with patients all over the world now. We've got virtual platforms. So we talk, uh, Doc Lippman, about accessibility. You can see a patient in Pakistan tomorrow. You can see a patient in London, not just in New York, face to face. So you guys can see him no matter where you are virtually listening to this program. Patients can schedule virtual appointments with him through his private practice at 1111 Wellness in New York City and also through the well. I'm breaking a promise to him right now. Uh, this guy has written five unbelievable books. I highly suggest that you take a look at them. Doc, don't get mad at me. He just wrote a book. It's coming out within a couple of months, hopefully towards the third quarter of this year or fourth quarter. The name of it's The New Rules of Aging Well, a simple program for immune resilience, strength, and vitality. So just want to thank you very much, Doc. I'm going to step off the virtual stage. I'm going to bring on my co-host, David. David, what an incredible opportunity you gave me. Really looking forward to co-hosting other shows and having monumental speakers such as Dr. Frank Littman. So thank you all. If you guys have any complaints on my talk tonight, email them to me, and I promise you I'll get them over to David. You are ridiculous. You are awesome. Thank you so much, Rudy. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Please do check out our website, biohackthe.world, for all the latest news and updates. And check out our newly launched Biohacker TV, a carefully curated bio video library on all things biohacking and health and wellness. There's also info on our next uh, Think Free screencast, which will be exactly one week from today, uh, Thursday, 7 p.m., with citizen scientist Chris Masterjohn, who will be teaching us or will be discussing nutritional deficiencies, vitamins and minerals, supplementation, and so much more. And if this episode spoke to you, please share it with a friend or two and leave a positive review. Also, remember to connect with us on social media and join our mailing list for the latest news and biohacking trends. Until next week, stay healthy, stay safe, and good night.